Of all of my father's films, Fantasia was his most experimental. It was his attempt to push the art of pure animation to a new level of artistry. He imagined Fantasia as a film that could evolve continuously by adding and subtracting pieces from the anthology of music and animation. We're pleased to have here at the museum two one-of-a-kind artifacts from Fantasia. The first, a notebook containing story meeting notes between my father and Leopold Stokowski and dad's team is full of ideas for further segments of Fantasia and is undergoing restoration in our collections department now. And the second, a most remarkable book that for the first time unveils some of the mysteries behind the special photographic effects of Fantasia, the notebook of Hermann Schulteis. Hermann Schulteis will be known as the man who created the Rosetta Stone of special effects animation during what we consider the golden age of Disney. I don't think there is anything comparable to the Schulteis notebook. This notebook is a treasure of information about the creation of some of the seminal films in the history of animation and American film. I think it's safe to say that without his documentation, a great many of the effects that were achieved for Fantasia would still be mysteries today. In February 1939, the special effects department put in a request for me. When I was given a choice between my position in the process lab and the special effects department, I chose the latter. It is my belief that the special effects will be one of the most important production departments in the studio, and my engineering, photographic, and musical knowledge can be used to the studio's best advantage in this department. Special effects work is perhaps the most intensely specialized in all of production. For each scene, a different process has to be worked out to produce the required optical illusion. In Fantasia, the special effects were the most intricate ones ever used in motion pictures. Fantasia was being made at the time of a real creative peak for the studio and for Walt Disney himself. The idea was to make the film just as rich and as beautiful and as evocative as it could possibly be, and then make it even better than that. We really don't know very much about Hermann Schultheis. He was born in Germany. He was an amateur anthropologist, archaeologist. Schultheis started at the studio early in 1938 to work in the process lab. He was there for about a year and then moved in early 1939 into the special effects department, which was just starting to blossom with a lot of new camera techniques. Schultheis was sort of a jack of all trades, so he was quite perfect to come and work on Fantasia. He was brought on to help in the creation of contraptions that would augment the special effects. He determined on his own to document what he was doing. And so he started out to do this notebook as a way of recording all of the technical details of how these specific effects were accomplished. And when they'd come to a problem that had never been tackled before and find a unique solution for it, they would take apart their equipment once that shot was done. So if he had not recorded all of this, we really wouldn't have any idea how some of those effects were done. Fortunately, with an extraordinary precision, Schultheis kept copious notes, took photographs behind the scenes, took individual frames of film from tests, and combined them into this notebook. He would put in a full day at the studio and then go home at night and work on this notebook. Every evening and on weekends for a long period of time. And the book itself is kind of a work of art. Fantasia is one of the most experimental of mainstream animated features ever made. Of course, today, these effects are very easy to do with computers, but back then it was all handmade, and that's what's so impressive about it. They had to calibrate things to the nth degree. Just opening the book to the first page is one of the most instructive things. 
There he's broken down the first phrases of the Toccata and Fugue in D minor by Bach, measure by measure with what was happening on the screen. The tops of the pages would be divided like dividers in a, in a binder, and the tab for that page will indicate the section of the music for which a particular effect was done. There's this page in which he comes up with a really complex flow chart for indicating exactly where one shot fades in, where it fades out, and what the shot looked like. In the scene where the snowflakes fall at the end of the Nutcracker Suite, that delicate scene was done with gears and with little railroad tracks. The transparent snowflakes are revolving by means of a planetary movement while they are traveling on small tracks towards the camera. During the shot, the camera is being tilted down so that we see close-ups of the snowflakes at the end of the scene. View underneath the gag, showing planetary movements and rails. The rails are covered with black velvet before shooting each frame. You're seeing these live action rotating snowflakes doubled onto sort of snowflake sprites that are going through the scene that are animated. It's combining different elements into a single image to achieve an effect that hadn't been seen before. The scintillating dewdrops on the spider web is another one of those examples of coordinating different elements together. The the position of the strands of the web had to be plotted so that it would coordinate with the background painting. Sugar plum fairy sequence. First exposure, pastel drawing on black. Second exposure, metal shavings on black. Two exposures together, scintillating dewdrops. And a rotating light rig was placed above those, and they were photographed while the rig was turned so far for each frame, the lights in this rotating light rig, they were projecting different colors, so you got different facets of these reflections. The Rite of Spring begins with a long camera trick through the universe. This was done with one of these jerry-rigged wooden multiplane cameras. In Schulteis's notebook, we see that it was made of three wooden easels that were tipped this way, had holes cut in them. The camera was here, and within the holes were pieces of glass on which were painted stars and the universe. They turned them at different speeds, and the camera shot through the three glasses and trucked in. There's a picture in the Schulteis notebook of Vesuvius exploding in 1933, and it's taken by Schulteis. Actual volcano eruption photographs taken on one of my trips to Italy. Having been inside the crater of an erupting volcano, I was able to give valuable information. They created this skyline of volcanic shapes and then suspended it upside down in a water tank. Cups on hinges drop white paint and water. They flipped the image back right side up, and it made a realistic picture of smoke. They went to tremendous effort and some expense to create this thing, and if you look very, very quickly, you can catch a glimpse of it in the finished film. One of the real showpieces of Fantasia is Night on Bald Mountain. The distorted ghosts coming up out of the graves are one of the most fascinating things here. What they did was paint the ghosts, put them on a revolving drum, and then reflect that image in a distorting mirror. White negative ghost travels on outside rim of drum. Distorted image in the mirror is shot by camera. Speed of revolving wheel is gradually increased to cause the ghost to disappear rapidly. There's one instance that you can see in the notebook of ghosts painted on a belt running on a flat horizontal surface, but it's being reflected at a 45 degree angle by this distorting mirror. Also, there was a village bell tower that twists at one point. Rippling distortion is added by shooting background projection image through distortion glasses. 
And again, all of this appears just very briefly, but if you look close, you can see it. The finale of Ave Maria is a very long, long trucking shot through a horizontal multiplane camera. The camera had to slowly go through six glass levels. Some of the larger multiplane shots took several days and nights of continuous shooting. We had to live and sleep in the studio for the duration. It took days, slowly, frame by frame, and it was perfect except someone had put the wrong lens on the camera. <laughs> so you not only saw the beautiful trucking through the forest, but you saw everything around it. Now the premiere was coming up, and they had like another week or so. So they put the whole thing on tracks again, and they're pushing through, and they're almost finished, and there's an earthquake. So now they're really <laughs> down to the wire. Nobody was allowed near the sound stage. No one was to come on there. They were just working straight through. They finally shot it, and it made the premiere. Herman Schulteis offered the scrapbook to the studio for $400 back in the day. And at that point, I guess it didn't seem important, as they didn't buy it. So he just tucked it away and kept it for decades. In 1955, a very strange thing happens to Herman. He was an inveterate traveler. He went on a trip to Guatemala, and he was last seen walking into the jungle with his camera and a, a pocket knife. And that's the last anyone ever heard of him. His widow lived on, I believe, into her 90s. And when she died, she willed the house to a nursing order of nuns. And among the contents were several books autographed to Herman Schulteis by Walt Disney. They brought in Howard Lowry, who is an expert on Disneyana and animation art. They went into the bedroom, and there was a Murphy bed that they pulled down, and there in a little space were the notebooks. The Schulteis notebook. It was one of the first acquisitions that I got to deal with. And upon receiving it and opening the pages, Every page was failing. The glue that was used, every object on the page were popping off. So it was the first conservation project that I got to manage. The Walt Disney Family Museum has an expert art conservation staff that went through and meticulously restored every detail of this notebook. Then the whole thing was digitized and put on display in the Walt Disney Family Museum in a really creative way. of mysteries about the processes that were used in these classic films that were guessed at but were not really proven until we could see them in the Schulteis notebook. This is a wonderful moment in history. This is Walt Disney with no limits on him. With the freedom to do these amazing creative things and keep topping them and making them richer and more and more elaborate for Disney fans, this is an invaluable artifact. 